Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Can I feel that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why you think our country so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Welcome to Bar Blog, and today I'm with Shannon and John of uh, Dual Power, Power Gathering, which is more an event than an organization. Um, and so we're going to talk today about what is the Dual Power Gathering, and then we're going to go into some of the philosophy and concrete goals that it wishes to achieve. So uh, let's start off. What is the Dual Power Gathering? Um, I, I could go, I don't know, like we've been talking for a little while before we started. So, um, dual power gathering is a, uh, we're bringing together, uh, a bunch of people from across, uh, North America, um, to, uh, to meet and to have a lot of discussions, debriefs, story time, uh, story, <laughs> uh, telling, um, also like shit, like, you know, playing games about strategy or, you know, sitting down and like watching like documentaries about like striking domestic workers, um, you know, talking about, you know, healing each other, all these kinds of things, skill shares. Um, and we're going to do it, um, at the end of July, uh, the last weekend in July, uh, outside of, uh, Chicago and the Indiana dunes. Yeah, so if I may, uh, the Dual Power Gathering is a collaborative event, uh, so it is what you make it when you come. Uh, we're going to provide for you some scaffolding, we're going to provide for you a place to set your tent up, we're going to provide for you some food, um, and we're going to ask you to come and host skill shares and teach us dances and put together some creative projects and envision the future and meet each other and broadly make friends and learn how to understand each other when you talk. So it's, it's a broad based event and, um, and it's a very participant led event. Uh, something that I think people may not be as used to, um, uh, it's interesting. I was actually thinking as you were talking how much of that verbiage I recognize from like uh, radical education pedagogy. Mm -hmm. but, um, Absolutely. And, um, and participatory, uh, participatory education. Um, so I guess one of the interesting things about this, though, is is dual power gathering also gives a hint that. Uh, an overriding philosophy of dual power may be involved in this, but to those who are uninitiated um, or don't speak left uh, in the various incarnations and camps that we have, um, what what do you guys mean by dual power? Um, so at least I'll say that the way that, that I've been putting it is like that I can only speak for myself because I think the dual power means a lot of different things depending on where you are and who you are. Um, but anytime that we're talking about something that we are working on to um, sort of replace the institutions that we are relying on, that we are also in, uh, you know, sort of attempts to undermine or get away from that limit our capacity to um, work together to meet our needs collectively. Uh, we're talking about dual power. So, you know, if we're talking about mutual aid projects, if we're talking about cooperatives, if we're talking about, you know, any of the sort of long standing um, 
longstanding organizations and longstanding infrastructures and longstanding relationships as opposed to things that are just popping up in response to an issue and then disappear again. So, you know, like basically the, the infrastructure for continued movement in the direction of the world that we want. So that's my sort of like general summary. I imagine uh, that a lot of people have a much more specific um, way of putting it, but I don't want to impose anything more than that on the event personally. So John might have uh, other ideas. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I helped um, draft and write the, uh, the dual power statement when um, I was in the Libertarian Socialist Caucus um, back in 2017, I believe. And um, we like the goal or the thought was, was that um, we need to be building kind of like the, as like Shannon said, the infrastructure and the basis for like collective power of like, you know, people who are in conflict with the state. Like there are people whose existence puts them in conflict with the state and with uh, capital. There's people whose, um, their work puts them in conflict with like uh, the state or capital. Um, and I think that as we on the left, I, you know, think that we haven't been thinking enough about rebuilding that infrastructure. We kind of take mm -hmm. some things for granted, or we think that any kind of infrastructure is just inherently bad or wrong. And I think that we were like, let's rethink how this will how we can rebuild these things or build the things that we need that we don't have that are going to um, kind of help build up our skills as like um, as working class people, working class communities, marginalized communities, um, build up our capacities to kind of take on um, the state and capital and, you know, get wins when we can and know when to, you know, quietly like, you know, make ourselves, um, hard to find that sort of thing, getting the kinds of things together that if you were serious about um, fundamentally changing social relations um, in North America. So like in the heart of like a, what appears to be a kind of ossified um, stumbling empire, what would that look like? And also recognizing that in, you know, in a lot of the work that we all do, we spend a lot of time building back up things that we have built before that then atrophy in between sort of like the bursts of energy um, that come up around these kind of crisis points. So, you know, thinking about what kind of investing energy and time in, in maintaining those long-term would do for our, our larger capacity and thinking about these as really like capacity building projects. So, I guess the question immediately when you say a capacity building project is capacity for what? That really is going to depend on who you are and where you are. <laughs> like I will say, you know, I could speak to like what I think we could use capacity for in my particular organizing context, but really frankly, like, there's nothing that's not easier if you can rely on people to feed you and keep you in your house and like, you know, uh, you know, provide the kind of care that you need to make your life viable. Um, ev like everything else we do is easier if you can rely on those things. So, you know, strikes can be more effective, occupations can be more effective, like any kind of, you know, uh, material interventions that we might make are more effective if those structures are resilient and uh, robust. And, you know, also in the course of that is really where we build the kind of trust relationships, at least in my organizing experience, that make it possible to think more, I don't know, ambitiously about what we can and can't achieve, right? And so when we're talking about capacity, I think that's a really big part of it, right? So if we're thinking, okay, you know, like even in the in the course of planning this event, right, where people were talking about um, this is what kind of a budget we might need to do such and such a thing when we're thinking, okay, well, if we're going to rely more uh, and put more trust into the um, into the the people that are coming in to participate, right? If we're going to rely more on on our collective abilities and our collective knowledge, um, we can have a more ambitious event. We need less money, right? Which means we need to work less to make it happen. Which means we're giving less of our time to the capitalists, and we have more time for each other and the things that we want to get done. 
Okay. Um, I think of, I think of uh, some stuff that happened during the uh, the George Floyd insurrection slash protest slash. <clears throat> I I actually am hesitant to use a singular word about them because I think depending on the area they're actually different things. But mm -hmm. um, what I what I would say about that is I would point out yeah I, I do think ultimately COVID unfortunately granting everyone a bunch of time that they may not have had anything else to do with um, as part of it. But I also think something that's missed out when people point that out is they also miss out that all these mutual aid networks actually emerged early on during mm -hmm. COVID for, for reasons that had nothing to do with the Floyd protest. Mm -hmm. But it enabled groups not to rely on NGOs <laughs> Uh, for for getting stuff done during the Floyd uh, the Floyd protest and insurrections, um, because there was material capacity to support people for a couple of weeks in a lot of cases in a lot mm -hmm. of urban areas, um, uh, and I I think that kind of thing is important, and I think it's also important to note that it wasn't done for that purpose. It was just done to to deal with like, well, here it was done mostly to deal with the homeless crisis uh, because no one else was dealing with it during the early COVID pandemic. And then it pivoted to ways to support, well, here it was mostly protesting, but um, ways to support protest. Um, have you uh, seen any other kinds of things where this kind of shift in, in something can happen very quickly because the capacity is already there? Um. One really good example is uh, in our uh, in our community. One of the things that we decided to do after we like settled on like building dual power type organizations was that we were going to set up a tenant union in our in our neighborhood. We have multiple billion dollar hedge fund type organizations trying to gentrify the shit out of my community. Um, one of which has one of the largest private police forces in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and we had, basically, we had built up this capacity, this kind of like, I hate using the word, like, like we had like a pool of people who had various skills and commitments. And um, we had a polar vortex land in Chicago in 2018 or the winter of 2019. I think it was... Yeah, and because we had had that and we had built, we found community organizing space that was brand new that we had been one of the first organizations to be able to go in there and build relationships. And because of this network of people who are doing, um, you know, mutual aid type work and uh, tenant organizing type work during the um, during this polar vortex, we basically shifted into the, into the, uh, disaster mutual aid mode. So we basically all piled into, you know, cars and we procured through various means like harm reduction stuff, Narcan, uh, we got food, we got clothes. Um, and then we started like literally driving out into like, it was temperatures, you know, they were saying were below what, you know, people experience in Antarctica and basically canvassing miles into you know the south side of chicago with people who were comfortable doing that um you know hitting every train station where someone might be trying to find shelter um going through uh tent campments uh you know we have various tent cities and people who didn't want to leave their tents that sort of thing making sure they had basics like propane for their heaters um food you know food uh you know harm reduction stuff um, and then the people who were ready to move, we got them into, you know, shelter and we provided like the only space where on the, you know, South side of Chicago, you could come in, no questions asked, asked and get a hot meal, get taken care of, um, make sure that you were, you know, not injured. We had street medics, um, helping us out with that. And it was really f a phenomenal thing. And that went on for like, you know, three or four days. Um, and it's kind of like a dry run for some of these bigger things that came, you know, a year or two later. So I think that that's exactly the kind of having an infrastructure set up, um, both physical and kind of like relational infrastructure 
and then being able to pivot when it was time, right? When something came up and it was clearly a threat to members of our community, and we were able to turn that and pivot and use that energy, resources, everything, we raised a shit ton of money and we took it and we were basically giving people bus passes to like hang out in the in the public transit. Um, the year after that, when the same thing happened, we, uh, I think 2021, we were putting people up in hotels, that sort of thing. So it was just like, it's a, it's a test of people's ability to organize and do things that really does have like real consequences. Yeah, I think I want to, I want to say too, because what we're talking about here is like, how do mutual aid projects impact our sense of our capacity? Um, that here in the Bay, there was something I thought, um, was really actually pretty interesting for us to think about, right? There was a ton of mutual aid projects that popped up. There were like so many people doing this work. It was mutual aid. It was primarily based on kind of donations from corporations or donations from the state or state funding, but it was, it was neighbors helping each other. Um, but there was, I think maybe somewhat less of what we might hope to see from a mutual aid project in terms of long-term relationship building in that where there was reciprocal um, care being given as opposed to people who had time and capacity um, stepping up to do basically volunteer work to take care of their neighbors, which is great. Like, I'm not going to talk shit about that. That's not something I would ever say is bad exactly. But like what we were interested in, given that that was the case, was what could we do with that energy that would maybe allow us to capture some of it for long term projects, like for into long term sort of like decommodification of various needs and to being able to build long-term relationships. So we were looking into, um, you know, what would a solidarity food system based on those mutual aid distribution networks look like? And how might we build up relationships with local farmers who are, uh, you know, in lots of ways already um, interested in our projects? You know, we had a, a list of uh, like BIPOC and, uh, you know, small farmers or radical farmers that are around. And of course, like I, we had have the the privilege of having having some of these people who who we can work with who have long-standing relationships with other people who have been doing this kind of stuff for a long time and trying to think about how those those mutual aid networks that popped up at the beginning of covid <clears throat> could actually potentially be the foundation for a longer term project that would allow us to reduce the the input in terms of money um, so like what would it look like for us to pull together buyer cooperatives uh, that looked kind of like CSAs. So the people who had money to spend could buy produce that they knew was supporting not only them, but other people who didn't have money to spend that were contributing in other ways, you know, and like kind of trying to think through some of the ways that we might be able to build up a longer term structure around that. And that's not really a conversation that we would have been having if those mutual aid projects didn't pop up in the first place, because it would have been far, far, far beyond our capacity. And it didn't turn out that we were able to do that right now. But I think that the work that we did there is really interesting and foundational for further conversations moving forward. You know, we were looking at models that um, we're coming out of Berlin, for example, where you've got a central garage where people are going to pick up their produce from a garage where a farmer has delivered it straight there because they know already exactly who's going to be buying their their food and so that there's less waste and da, 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 whatever. So, you know, we were trying to think about that and like it would have been so far beyond what we would be imagining would be possible with the energy that we have just among the people who are ideologically committed to these projects. And so you can see that sort of like capacity builds very quickly as people start to think about themselves as um, sort of responsible for our collective survival and collective thriving, I think. So, you know, like on one hand, we see it working out. And on another hand, we see it maybe not working out the way that we were imagining it in this kind of like larger context. But but it's easy to see where uh, capacity is being built still, even if the project doesn't come to fruition right now. You know, it's definitely something now we know better how to do that seems more possible. Okay. Um, one thing that you brought up because it's an obsession of mine, and this kind of uh, goes back to the beginning, is um, skill sharing and the. Um, and I think we talked about this actually before we started recording and, and specifics, but the way that that um, experience, uh, even in a non hyper hierarchical, non sectarian organization, still can lead to sort of. 
uh, informal hierarchies and quote the tyranny of structurelessness unquote. Um, um, but I want you to go into the vision of skills sharing here and why you guys think it's important and maybe that'll pivot us more about why now. So let's let's start with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I can say why I think this is important. Um, one of the main things that I think is really significant here is that we're trying to create a space that's valuable to both veteran organizers and people who are working in organizations that really like have pulled together their projects and have a clear idea of what they're trying to do. And also people who are coming into spaces and don't have those things already, who are maybe newer to organizing, um, because we think that if we had the answers already, we wouldn't be in this position, that there aren't clear uh, answers or strategies to get this all done perfectly, that everybody is a piece of the puzzle and knows something and, is, and has something to contribute, and that we don't know what they have to offer. So like creating a space for people to come in and share the skills that they have that can be relevant to you know, our organizing in ways that we might not even have thought of yet um, really does, I think, create a, a sort of firmer ground uh, for the kind of like political ambition that we all have something to contribute to this work and that it's going to look really different in a lot of contexts and that the best thing we can do to be prepared for an uncertain future is build up our skills and our relationships with people that we know have skills that are specialized so that we can share those skills as necessary uh, and that we can be learning together collaboratively from each other's experience and like we all know <clears throat> that we're famous for reinventing the wheel and that is something that we really don't have time for anymore um i mean it's not like we ever really had time for it but like i think we really really don't have time for it now um but that means that we're gonna need to learn to learn from each other more i think like humility is really an important piece of the of the puzzle right now that we need to be um practicing and so having these opportunities to have people come in and instruct on the things that they do know um i think creates just a, a yeah just like a stronger sense of of how much we need each other in this moment in all moments yeah yeah i mean like when i was a baby leftist uh i was given a copy of a book called helping health workers learn and it was written by people who's like had spent years in uh, central Mexico, like building up um, village level health systems with people who were, you know, basically indigenous communities, high rates of illiteracy, um, embattled by the state, you know, local oligarchs, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, that's how I got introduced to Palo Freire and um you know like concepts of popular education and i think that there's like this unfortunate tendency on the left to think that the the goal is to be the smartest person in the room who has like all the answers and all the skills to you know pull off some event or something um and i think there's a tendency to not be very good at listening and finding out where people's strengths are and building collective knowledge. And so, you know, I, one of the things that I've took away from that was that, you know, if you get a group of people together, um, there's going to be a broad array of like, uh, skills and experiences and that, um, if you don't bother to ask, if you don't bother to talk with people, if you don't work to kind of intentionally, um, do this, people fall into the habit of just like, well, this person sounds like they know what they're doing. I'll just kind of like follow them. Um, it's going to sound really corny, but uh, I read like Sun Tzu, like as a teenager going to uh, anti-globalization <laughs> mobilizations. <laughs> and one of the lessons in Sun Tzu is that, you know, there's a role for everybody. There is something for everyone to do. And, um, and I will say that like, doing the work of building this um, event has really shown, like has like kind of validated that. Like we have people coming in who we are, you know, um, who are coming from all sorts of different experiences, 
positions, places like, uh, you know, organizations, and people are stepping in and doing some really incredible stuff um, and have skills that, you know, they were like, you know, one of uh, one of the people who's now taking a more prominent role was like, you know, every time I came into like some sort of leftist organization, it felt like I was landing in the middle of it. And no one took the time to ask, you know, more or less didn't take the time to find out what was it that I had to offer, right? And so um, using our skills as, you know, meeting facilitators and just building relationships, like organizing is building relationships. That's kind of like uh, <laughs> someone, some famous DSA person was talking about how they like went to a wedding and convinced like a table full of bridesmaids to like vote for Bernie Sanders or something like that. And uh, which, I mean, you know, maybe not the best, like uh, best like example of it, but literally you took a relationship that you built with these people and you turned it into a form of action. And like, there's all kinds of ways in which that can be useful and helpful. Right. So like I'm as a, as a union nurse, um, I have, uh, through the course of my organizing work, gone out and build relationships with people that I can kind of count on that are outside of maybe my union, are in other nurse unions. Um, and it's like the the act of showing up to another striking, uh, you know, nurse unions, like picket lines with like, hey, here's a bag full of like, uh, you know, handheld ham radios. And here's my PA and a couple of uh, bullhorns. Um, what can I do to help? right? As opposed to being the people that show up to the picket line with a newspaper or pamphlet or whatever and try to get people to co-sign off on some, um, you know, abstract set of political principles. Um, and it's kind of like, I have relationships now because we went to go share and help and build solidarity, you know? Mm -hmm. cool. And um, the goal, and kind of getting back to what you're saying, Varn, you know, it's like, we all have to do the work of reaching out to people and finding out what they can do and then finding out what you have and what you know, and you bring it to the group and you say like, I can walk you through how to set up a flyer. I can walk you through, you know, wheat pacing. I can walk you through uh, a picket line training. Right. And these are the, or during the George Floyd uprisings, uh, we, you know, under the guise of our tenant union did a uh, community, protest health and safety trainings that like taught people how to do eye flushes or how to stay safe in the streets um, or how to do a canvas. How do you canvas your building? How do you have an organizing conversation with like your neighbors, those sorts of things. So these are the kind of skills that if we're not sharing them, people will burn the fuck out. It's literally a survival thing, right? Like if, if we're all burned out cause we're um, cause we're tired cause we're the person everyone calls to solve the problem. That's terrible <laughs> for, uh, for the movement, right? So um, the goal is to, and it's not to send people on pointless organizing tasks, right? Like, I think that's the activist experience for a lot of people who came into activism through like, uh, through a campus is you encounter some group like ISO and they're like, here's a hundred papers, go sell them. Here's flyers, go put them up. And it doesn't really have any relation to the actual, to like your own personal well being or your own like uh, material circumstances. Um, and so what skills do you learn, right? Um, so making sure that you kind of spread those skills out, especially in these things where they have a real material impact on people's lives um, or their well-being, I think is a lot more powerful. Yeah, I think so. in, the, in the context of the event too, you know, like from a really structural perspective, like if <clears throat> we think that the most important thing that we can get done in a weekend is for people to meet each other and start to build trust together, that's not something that really gets done in a room where everybody is facing the front and listening to one person talk. And so what we want is for there to be a lot of different things going on for people to be able to follow what's compelling to them, to find other people who are compelled by that, and for them to all sort of be able to practice these collaborative learning uh, techniques that we've been talking about this whole time. Because I think that is how you know, again, we learn to trust each other. So like we, you know, we have, I think we all came away from previous experiences with various kinds of gatherings and conventions and meetings and this kind of stuff um, with a sense of how one of the 
biggest things we need to overcome is that we don't necessarily mean the same things when we use the same words. And we sometimes use different words to mean the same thing. And that this is an issue that has to do with, you know, our personal experiences, with the cultures of organizing that we come from, you know, there's a lot of different factors for that or whatever, but like, that it's something that can really only be overcome at the sort of like person to person level. And, you know, I think it like when you get beyond kind of small group engagement, it's really difficult <coughs> to um, kind of break through that sense of like group momentum to get to that point where you're able to say, for example, like constructively disagree with somebody, you know, without having to feel like you've shamed yourself in front of a room of 50 people or whatever it is, you know, that there's this sort of like, um, we're trying to like lower the barrier to actual engagement with the ideas because we really are like concerned about the living, the living ideas here. We're really concerned about like, you know, a sort of, a, yeah, like a re-engagement with how we're all actually a part of building the politics, you know, like we're sort of working on the like narrative arc, you know, together. And it's not just something that we're plugging into that exists beyond us. It's not something that's like, um, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's not, it's not sort of like the, I mean, it's, I guess it's not really the ground we walk on. It's the, it's the, the thing we build, right. Or whatever. I don't know. It's not a great anal analogy, but um, it seems like in some ways a, a, a kind of like course correction for me, at least from some of the things that, that I've been seeing where people are, are, you know, really looking for these kind of like programmatic, uh, solutions to our current, to, uh, you know, challenges. And I think that that's just not really, uh, realistic and it's not really, um, like, I think it's just not very good strategy at this point for us to be looking for like a programmatic solution. Um, it seems like since we don't, you know, as we, what, if any, if anything we've learned in the last two years, it's that we don't know what's coming <laughs> and we have like some ideas of things that we should be able to expect and anticipate. Um, but we need to be resilient and we need to be flexible and we need to be dynamic and we can't do those things without this kind of like, learning from each other experiences um yeah i mean also like the actual act of pulling this together itself is going to be our goal is to publish a debrief that basically uh, some sort of debrief document so that people can see how we did it right mm -hmm. because we did this kind of from the ground up i've been part of these things before, but never has there really been an intentional effort to make sure we're documenting every single meeting and we're going through the process of how we're doing it and how do we do it in the way that we're, we've caught, we've caught a, a, a fair amount of flack for doing this not online. And part of, there's some real intentional dis decisions that were made to make this an in-person thing. And, um, and I think we've been pretty transparent about it. Part of it is COVID safety. Being outside is just the safest place to be in the middle of a pandemic. Pandemic's still going on, unfortunately. Um, and, um, but also like building the relationships and show and doing that kind of, um, the kind of like parallel discussions that then merge into each other or split up breakouts kind of spontaneously able to like, and I'm not saying like spontaneously in a very frou frou kind of like woo kind of way, but like in a in a very like intentional like sometimes it's time to stop a discussion and move on to another discussion. Uh, one of the people who's been really like keystone for helping us um, pull this together, sort of like a movement organizer, was like you know one of the rules in anything like this is the law of two feet. You know, there are going to be times when someone's going to get up and you know, what they have to say just doesn't feel very valuable to folks. And the capacity to just get up and walk away and not feel like you're walking away from an opportunity is like, uh, because there's something going on just around the corner that you can like um, get engaged with that does pique your interest is like the sort of thing that I think we really think is valuable. So we, you know, a space for people to learn skills, yes. But the skill building is almost like a secondary goal. The primary goal is building relationships mm -hmm. and um, facilitating 
like the act of doing it helps us learn how to make sure that people can do it and like going forward because we want people to take this if they want to as like a here's a, a template tear out the parts that suck or that you don't think apply to your situation and then improve it <laughs> yeah make yeah. it better yeah i mean I, you know i think we have definitely been thinking a lot about how to make this event valuable to people who are not able to attend for any of the reasons, you know, uh, temporal, financial, like spatial, whatever. Um, and the event is going to have in particular pieces of it that are meant to create some records. Uh, we're you know, talking about having a storytelling tent set up where people can kind of come in anytime and use it as kind of like a confessional diary of what's been going on, you know, like an interesting conversation that they were part of, uh, like what they're doing in their projects outside of the event, you know, these kinds of things we were talking with, um, with different people about creating audio content that can be turned into potentially uh, like streamable you know, um, sessions later or something like that, but to really make that elective for people um, as opposed to something that's uh, happening in every single discussion so that people are open <coughs> to feel more, I think, uh, comfortable kind of getting into some of the, the more complicated or um, unsettled questions that need to be engaged with as opposed to like feeling like everything they say is going to be um, you know, captured for posterity. So they better be very, very careful about what they're talking about. Because I think this is not really like, conducive to the kind of experimentation that that we think is, is possible in, in a space that we're all sharing physically. But we're definitely thinking about how to um, capture and make, make available the lessons of the event, you know, be they organizing lessons or like lessons that people are bringing into the space from their own experiences for people who aren't able to be there. Um, but when we were thinking about like, what's the, what's the purpose of our spending this time together, we realized that the kind of things that you need to do to structure an event that can be um, happening online uh, are sort of maybe not conducive to the kind of relationship building that we think is our primary goal. I, I guess there's a bunch of keywords in that, and some of them speak to me, again, uh, interestingly more as an educator than as an organizer, um, mm -hmm. although I'm both. Um, but one of the things that I always try to import to people who want to do organizing that a lot of what they're doing is first educating and by educating i don't mean consciousness raising and i don't mean uh here's my pamphlet with a 16 point political program for which you had no input which mm -hmm. is kind of a big deal um you know uh you know uh i i find it interesting for example that a lot of people talk about radical democracy and participation and then they'll try to give you a uh, a program that's come up with by about five to seven people at most um, in a small sectarian sub organization. Um, and, and I find that interesting because I, I don't know that I'm principal, well, I'm not principally opposed to a, a, a program, but I am opposed to saying that we already have one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I find that interesting. Uh, but the other thing I find in, I also think is important to emphasize, and I, I want people to bring it out and hear me say it because people want to accuse me of being hippy dippy ever. Um, I'm like got a reputation for being the opposite of that, maybe almost a borderline sociopath. Um, uh, so, <laughs> um, Rick, you need a hug. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, Varn, come, come to the come to the healing circle. Just come come, to, come yeah. hang out with us on the dunes. Yeah. There's oh, there, we are literally going to be like five to ten minutes away walking to the surf. You can walk into a wave if you're if you if you're beginning to see red, or you can come and hang out with us. We can we just like help you like get yourself centered before you go back out just into come, the world. Come do nurturance culture with us. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm gonna live up to my Bay Area roots here now. <laughs> um, but I, I have been trying to get people to realize that, like, even education is 90% relationships. Like, mm -hmm. that's the first thing when I talk to someone who's entering teaching is like, 
One, can you build the relationships? Two, can you have the empathy? And then three, which is the weird, almost contradictory point, can you turn that empathy off? Um, which is a strange thing to have to talk about, but it's also related to burnout. Um, uh, one thing I, th I think I've seen in mutual aid projects, um, and there's a lot of criticism go around, and I will address uh, some of the other criticisms that I don't think is legitimate at all uh, later on. Um, but one thing I have seen is if you don't structure the community and um, responsibilities around mutual aid correctly, um, you either risk turning into a pseudo NGO charity or you have massive burnout or both. Actually, I've seen both too. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what lessons do you think? And, and I know this is, you, we, this is hard to talk about preemptively because part of the point of this kind of organization is to bring a whole bunch of different people with different skills and different life experiences and be like, share and let's collaborate and figure out what the hell all this means. But um, uh, what what things have you seen that an event like this may be able to help with in regards to preventing things like activist burnout or organizer burnout? Mm -hmm. One of the main things we were talking about in the beginning of our conversations out of which this event was born um, was that if our projects are not creating more energy than they're taking, they're not sustainable. And that's something that we need to think about before we get started. Um, I think this question of like, what are our, you know, sort of like if we if we base our relationships on collective care, what are our capacities from there, as opposed to like, what are our goals and how can we sort of like um, mold ourselves around them? I think that's a pretty important sort of intervention point to uh, what I think is a larger question of how do we kind of like unlearn our self instrumentalization that is part of our capitalist subjectivity. Um, and so I think though that, you know, that first of all, like we should benefit from our mutual aid work and it should make our lives easier as well as the other people who we're participating with. And that's gonna be, I think, important to any kind of a sustainable project. And then I think like <coughs> having a good sense of like, how do we deal with the struggles that we all bring into these spaces that are, you know, the result of the failures of capitalism to, or I don't want to actually, I'm going to back that up a little bit. It's not a failure of capitalism to provide for our caring needs. It is just not something that is valued by the, the, uh, the larger, you know, in, sort of like productivity obsessed society uh, under this kind of like, you know, profit motivated value structure. Um, and so, you know, it's like, we know that we're all coming into these situations with our struggles and our traumas. And, you know, I don't know anybody who came to uh, radical organizing who didn't come through some kind of just like hard reality check at some point you know maybe it was like very young like for you know this is kind of my experience i think a lot of people i know or maybe it was later um but we're all struggling with the reality that we're expected to face you know like our story for what's going on in the world the narrative that we all like more or less share the big one it's fucking hard <laughs> it's really damning right it's like finding the opportunities to organize ourselves together around the kinds of hope and care and meaning making and sort of like collective um, agency. That's really important to kind of not um, continually re-traumatizing ourselves as we move constantly in the direction of these really difficult realities and constantly in the direction of these really um, you know, like frankly, just very traumatic experiences that we often are exposed to in the course of our organizing, you know, um, like even independent of our individual lives, right? Like I think that those things actually can do a lot to sort of offset some of those, uh, some of the challenges that we see coming up in organizations really routinely. Um, and then another thing is to go back to this point about skill sharing, right? Like I think a lot of us have at different times fallen into the trap of becoming maybe over identified with our organizing and we need to be in situations where we do not feel like if i take a step back for however long that 
that the entire organization is going to collapse, you know, and like a lot of us do feel that way. And it's not for no reason. It's because we build our organizations where we're just kind of grinding ourselves down because this is part of the way that we feel valuable and it makes us feel better about the problems being bigger than what we can control, you know, and, you know, I don't want to project that onto anybody else. So I'll say that's definitely something that I've experienced personally. And I've known a lot of other people who have gone through that by their own admission. So, you know, thinking more about this sort of ecology of, uh, you know, of relationships and, and, you know, varying ways that we can connect ourselves together to make our lives easier and more fulfilling, as opposed to, you know, kind of how do we create instrumentalized structures of, you know, of people to, to meet these kind of abstract goals, um, I think is a, as a, a step in the, in the right direction. Um, I hope. And then, you know, beyond that, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be participating in a, a health autonomy and community, um, community healing space while we're out there. And I know I, I personally, this is kind of my, um, area of focus and area of research as well. So, um, I've talked to a lot of other people who are interested in, in asking and answering these these questions, and I don't know uh, the the answer to that really. Like what I've you know said is is more or less the best I can I can provide right now, and I feel like I've spent a lot more time thinking about this than than most people because you know as I said again, it's my area of research. So um, even just being able to have this conversation really frankly and openly about how these things do impact our organizing. Um, and like recognizing that we need to think maybe I mean, this is gonna like there's some I mean there because there's some like pretty difficult things we need to get into if we're gonna take this really seriously and maybe this is not the forum for that and we can all talk about this in person but you know like what does it mean to be accountable for yourself when we're in kind of situations where people are like you know engaged in these patterns of behavior that are um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, like self-destructive and that like create these kind of cascading um, challenges for people in organizations because burnout is like literally contagious. <laughs> you know, it is not a thing where you get burned out and you pushed yourself to into the red and you did it because, you know, you need to get through it. And so it's the self-sacrificing thing. I think that's how we tend to think about it, but it is not, that's not how it works, right? Like your burnout causes other people to need to step up to deal with where you're unable to, you know, come forward as your, as your best self. And like, how do we think about, you know, as a, as a matter of respect for the projects that we're involved in and for the people that we're trying to, trying to work with, you know, even if we can't summon that level of respect for ourselves, right? Like, where do we, where do we see that as our, as our responsibility to, to the things that we really care about, to our values, to, to, to our future, you know, to take better care of ourselves and each other. And I always say we have to take care of each other so we can take care of each other. Um, that's just like one of my truisms. So yeah, I've been talking now for a long time, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of building off that, cause we were talking about uh, trans locality or trans localism yeah. earlier. And um, one of the things that I learned, because I got into this shit like back in 2001 or whatever, uh, you know, anti, anti globalization shit, that was before alter globalization got attached to it, whatever. Um, I just came away from those experiences being like, wow, we're traveling a lot of miles to go do a thing, right? And then we leave, and then what did we leave behind? Mm -hmm. And um, thinking when I came to the conclusion that building um, building independent working class power was something that I think is like um, a like a movement like a strategic imperative for the for the left in, Amer in North America today <clears throat> I started thinking a lot more locally and I'd been thinking locally for a while it's like I'm not traveling anymore to like a giant demo like thousands of miles away I'm just not going to do it because I don't have the time and energy to do it um, but I found that I had a lot more capacity when all of a sudden I'm not fighting for you know I'm fighting my boss I live you know a bike ride away from where my uh, where my uh, bosses are uh, I'm fighting the landlord in my community the, the landlord's office, I like I walk past it on a pretty regular basis. Um, when you can get to and fro, I think that there's this, and it comes from, I think, 
a left that largely like that is still has a lot of people who are coming to it because they picked up ideas in college and they got involved in activism in college and their material circumstances. Now this is different for folks out wet, uh, on the West because I know that the struggles of, like the student movement in on the West coast has been different than the, than it might be in other places. Um, but in my experience, there's this mentality that you go and help other people in other communities. And when I, when I really committed to building power in my community first, um, that's not a selfish thing, right? It's not selfish to fight your boss over a thing that's fucking you over because, you know, you might get a win and that win is going to, is going to, uh, actually impact a lot of other of your coworkers. And if you do it the right way, you're building more collective power while you're doing it. And it is so much easier to do that when you're actually, you're, you're, you're the terms of mo like your motivation for doing that, your capacity to do things changes when it's something that is actively like hitting, like it's your, like uh, my, my partner will be straight up. It's like, it's hitting you in the fucking paycheck. Right. So, um, I think that just we're talking about building capacity. And when we started this project, we called a lot of, we reached out through our networks and we were asking all kinds of folks and everyone was at capacity. Everyone's burned out. <clears throat> we did like two and a half years of pandemic, uh, you know, massive uprising, uh, terrible like uh, sort of political climate. Um, and people were just like, this sounds great. We are at capacity and we can't really do anything to make that. We can't help, but we're excited to see what, where this goes. And I think our goal is, is that if you're going to come to this, you're going to come away with more relationships that you can lean on when you need something. If you're effective at your organizing, you're building relationships and those relationships are like a mutual thing. You know, we talk about mutual aid. They go both ways. They're reciprocal. And so when you ask for help from someone, they're going to be there for you, you know, um, and you're learning from each other and you're getting, you're getting more knowledge about what's going on and having more knowledge that's more accurately reflects the world that we're in makes your organizing more effective. Nothing worse than fucking like wasting your time, frittering away, like valuable time trying to hammer away at something that is not going to happen because you didn't have like an inside piece of knowledge. Right. And so it's like, it's all these things. It's like, we don't have all the answers for how to build capacity, but I think that a lot of us are getting kind of some, a better sense of how this is a long haul. It's the, the stereotype or the, uh, the cliche is like, this is a, a marathon, a sprint. Um, and that's very true. And I think that I've learned so much that, you know, and I know other people learn that stuff as well. So I think that it's really thinking about how is it mutual aid? And so if you're doing something based on mutual aid and solidarity, it should bring you to a place where you have relationships you can li rely on um, and resources that you didn't have before. What yeah. pro what what did your project give you that you, at the end of the day you have more like more resources than you had before? <laughs> yeah, and this is none of this is to say that that it's not important for us to be organizing in relationships of solidarity, you know, across distance. Um, obviously, we think that is important because we're trying to organize an event for people to come from across distance to meet <laughs> each other. Um, and it's not to say that global solidarity isn't important. It's extremely important, but like, you know, we've been saying, I think like our sort of political milieus have been saying that global solidarity is important for a long time, but we have no capacity to meaningfully provide it, right? Like, how are we providing solidarity, right? Like, I mean, and this is not to say again, also that there aren't things we can do in terms of just disrupting or putting pressure and changing the political costs of various things for people in other parts of the world based on our position here in the US. But we don't have the capacity to provide material solidarity for our comrades that are doing the things that we are inspired by in other parts of the world. And how do we build the things that we need that can make our lives such that we can provide that? Like, how do we do that? And we don't do it by focusing 
on these projects that we can't currently achieve. We focus, we do it by focusing, we think, on on things we can achieve now that build, again, with this capacity conversation, right? But that build our capacity to be able to, to do this stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of that comes down to decommodifying our lives in various ways, right? Like, you know, if we think of money as a substitute for trust, right? It's like how people can compel other people to do stuff for them without having to trust them. Then we can think of trust as a sort of like, you know, trust building as a strategy for, for you know, moving toward further decommodification. That again, then frees up more of our time and more of our, you know, our, our capacity to do the sorts of things that we would need to do to actually show up for each other. Um, you know, I was fortunate to be at the at the gathering out in, at Woodbine for the Northeast um, uh, region of symbiosis uh, a couple weekends ago, and you know we had a um, a Hevel from the Kurdish diaspora in Berlin come down and just point blank ask us like, you want to be in solidarity? Like, okay, like, <coughs> so what? You know, like, what does that look like? What does it mean? What are we trying to do? And it's like we don't really have good answers to those questions right now. And I'm not suggesting I think we're going to be able to come up with them at the gathering because I don't necessarily think we need the answers to those questions to get started moving in the right direction. But I do think we kind of know what we need to do to get ourselves in a position where we have the strength and capacity here in the U.S. to do the kinds of things that are actually going to help our comrades in other parts of the world be more successful with their organizing. Um, just like, you know, in terms of, you know, all the, whatever, <laughs> all the, all the, all the ways that the United States uh, you know, structurally makes it difficult. Yeah, okay, there's uh, oh, that last bit. Um, I lived abroad for nine years and in some pretty hairy situations, and I've been involved in some pretty hairy situations, which you'll never hear me talk about on air, ever. Um, but um, the one thing I will say is that. I've been frustrated by the international solidarity piece because on one hand it's important and it's often been ignored by groups like the DSA. Uh, but when they do pick it up, it is to make obnoxious political statements on Twitter by a committee that issues stuff out, uh, basically telling people in other places what they should or should not be doing or how Americans should or should not relate to this or that state um, uh, and not on anything that they can affect in their actual real life. Now, I have a theory about this, about like when people feel helpless, they often turn to things like international solidarity because frankly, you can care about it and not do shit ever. And don't also don't feel like the defeat is your defeat because it's not your community. Um, and while I understand that impulse, I also think it's kind of destructive. Um, having lived in, in, in some of these communities, uh, uh, I, particularly during the Egyptian counter revolution is the, the one where I got the, the biggest eye opening that I ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that is what I'm saying, because it, it's like, don't, don't offer solidarity or don't talk about internationalism as a position that you hold and can put a Twitter banner on, because frankly, that does not fucking matter. Like tweets are cheap. Yeah. They're less than cheap. Hot, <laughs> hot take, hot take. Um, I mean, yeah, when they serve as a pressure valve, they're like actively destructive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, I, I'm a big proponent of, I think part of our thing our a huge part of our problem is that we don't have enough connection with an internet with international connections where we can learn from each other in real ways and i think that this is particularly acute with um our connection with the mexican left in its various iterations yeah and there I, isn't any <laughs> yeah I, I mean they 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 are there but they are tenuous and i think that especially because we share an economy like you can just look at it straight up like that. Like there's a, there's a bright red line that keeps us like that is de deliberately there to keep us separate. And, um, and I feel like the, the Mexican left has a lot of really interesting, amazing things that have been their recent developments that I feel like we 
have not there. It, I, what frustrates me is when I see um, it doesn't feel like they're like there are the people who are putting the F time and effort into building those connections don't seem to have the kind of like they're not getting organizational support. Um, they're either from unions or from groups like DSA. Um, and so I think that like we have an obligation to build, um, you know, powerful, like, you know, powerful, serious movements here in the United States and to build connections to people in those uh, outside of the United States to be effective internationalists before we do anything. I mean, before we can really be like the kind of internationalists that I think many people would like to think of themselves as. Yeah, this, I want to say this may be, be a little inflammatory for the context, but we don't need to get too far into it. But like, we probably need to be taking really seriously countering fascist uh, power building in the United States if we're really talking about solidarity with our comrades abroad, because like, that's not a problem just for us. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it looks like we don't need to get too far into it right now, but yeah. Um. I, I will spare you my normal shit throwing because I'm usually pretty willing to do it. But uh, uh, the Mex uh, uh, John knows this, but my and I think most of my audience may not may know this, but I, I lived in Mexico, particularly during the teachers' strikes, um, uh, uh, um, strongly down in Oaxaca. So that's a mixed bag. But I went down there, um, and it was it became even more evident. Um, uh how much the american left was even disconnected from itself on this because people don't know that like americans have actually died covering teacher strikes and movements in in uh oaxaca and chapias and like i don't like i learned that in mexico not in the united states where i'm from um and of whom we were talking about people uh being involved um and so i think that's important i've actually i also think that the important of like I, I know that uh, uh, this phrase comes from a guy who's not a leftist, but the skin in the game concept is actually really important. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to internationals and we have skin in the game with immediately with Canada, Mexico, uh, the Caribbean, um, to some degree, Cuba, because it's really close. Uh, uh, and some of the Pacific islands that are U.S. territories that we should probably be paying more attention to, <laughs> like Guam and American Samoa and whatnot. Um, and, and and because we share an economy with them, and they are often used as in, uh, internal or semi-internal cheap labor, um, and they also have their own right-wing problems, et cetera, and so forth, and they overlap more, and yet... I often feel like I'm more likely to hear about something far, far away or in Europe or in South Asia or somewhere <coughs> in South America that's that's even more removed from our context, not even Central America, where American policy really, really, really matters and is a mm -hmm. matter of life and death for a lot of people. Um, I mean, there's a reason why the murder rate in Honduras is uh, uh, 65 per one uh per hundred thousand which if for people to want a comparison i think the highest in the united states is like 11 per hundred thousand anywhere um and that has to do with american drug policy so like stuff like that is important and also those are the people that that people are putting in cages at the border also um so these are things that we should really be doing um, but I also think we can't just we can't just abstractly do it. Like me just declaring my love for Central America is I mean, it's somewhat meaningful. I don't want to say it's not meaningful at all, but it's not particularly meaningful. So I guess this gives me I, I, we talked about this a little bit. John brought it up. Um, this trans locality idea. I'm actually interested in that because, yeah, I'm an internationalist. Uh, I'm not a national list. Um, and <laughs> I've also been very frustrated on the left's general assumption of methodological and organizational nationalism and then like nothing in between at all 
and also not looking at the problems of limiting yourself to, I mean, cause it's not just, it's not just that trans localism, I think is a kind of local focus. It's also not limiting yourself to a national context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So would you like to talk about what you guys mean by that? How that's become sort of a way to, to envision what you're trying to do here? I guess I would say that, you know, people will kind of, you know, if you think about what sort of problems we have that we're encountering, right, they are diverse. Um, What scale we should be thinking about addressing those problems depends on the problem. There are a lot of problems that, like, I should be addressing with the people who live on my block. And there are a lot of problems I should be addressing with all the people who are going to be dealing with the same sorts of climate disruptions as me. And there are a lot of problems I should be addressing with all the people who are going to be internally or externally displaced by different kinds of uh, climate realities. Like, I mean, I'm a climate change researcher, social scientist. So like, this is definitely where my thinking really kind of comes back to. So I'll like sort of expose my bias there. But, you know, when we're thinking about, say, like, you know, at the at the Detroit Symbiosis Congress, we had some uh, companies come up from Oaxaca and they were talking about how one of their struggles was against the green energy companies that were being funded by the state of California because of its uh, green energy initiatives. And so like as a Californian, now that's my responsibility to be aware of that. And that's an opportunity for actual meaningful material solidarity that I wouldn't have had if they hadn't come to tell me that, you know, but like we do need to be in some ways responsible for um, I think thinking at uh, being able to think at different scales and in different scopes and like trying to really understand how each of these problems requires a different frame and different like you know bounds of solidarity with whom are we are we involved in 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 different issues is like something that isn't consistent you know across all of our our different uh um challenges so for me like when we're talking about translocality i'm really thinking about the ability to kind of like move between those different scales to address in the container that it's relevant, the various problems that we're, that we're facing and the various opportunities that we have as well. Um, thinking about this sort of framework for it, I know like when we started doing our tenant work, we were finding that the people who are buying the landlords who are buying buildings and then like turning them into basically like unlivable hell holes for the tenants were coming from, it was money coming from California or, (laughs) or money coming from, uh, from uh, New Jersey or money coming for, or it was a hedge fund of uh, money built by some oligarch in uh in new jersey but it's probably like uh actually a front for you know gulf oil money that sort of thing yeah, and we have a lot um, of chinese investment out here too yeah, yeah i mean and then it. speaking with uh i was speaking with a reporter from china who come to the u.s um and we were uh relating on um, the Chinese housing crisis and how it mirrors the housing crisis in the United States in a way that I think a lot of people who um, maybe superficially think that they know a lot about China don't. And we were kind of laughing about it together. Um, and so it's kind of like you build these, um, you build relationships and you build understandings based on your iteration of an experience that does happen elsewhere, right? Um, we had people asking us, what are we talking, well, like what kind of, what, what, what is gonna be the meaningful discussion around climate at you know, this event? And I'm like, well, there's gonna be climate refugees there. Mm-hmm. Like we have friends who are climate refugees. They're gonna be there and they're gonna have a lot to say about it. Um, I have neighbors that are climate refugees. They came after Katrina, right? And so the thought is these things, we're no longer, we we don't have the luxury of looking at ourselves as being somehow isolated from all of these effects of, you know, these various forces that are buffeting all of us and all of our communities anymore um, to the extent that, you know, some of us did, were able to kind of like lean on that. Um, and I think that 
just kind of like looking at what's going on in your local community and then kind of being able to relate to that, to what's happening in other people's communities and then building the relationships based off of those shared experiences. And that's the basis for solidarity and mutual aid. Yeah, I think we're gonna need to start, I mean, maybe this is a bit of a tangent, but if we're talking about climate refugees, uh, you know, as a, a serious issue, which I think we can all agree it is because, you know, people on the move makes resource distribution really difficult in the rigid structures that we have set up to manage those things now. And like we see a lot of sort of authoritarian response to challenges to that stability, which is necessary to, you know, sort of maintain some of these, the legitimacy of some of these systems. Um, you know, we have to acknowledge to say, for example, like, you know, I am a lifelong Californian. I've lived here 36 years and I haven't, I don't feel I have a future in the state and I know I'm not the only one who feels that way. And so, you know, a lot of my friends are, you know, sort of early, I mean, we have the privilege of, you know, of, of migration to some extent, but a lot of people are leaving for this reason, you know, like we're going to see a lot of in internally displaced people and we're going to have to kind of expand our understanding of what a climate refugee is and what our, our, organizing is going to have to do to deal with that you know what is it going to mean for us to be able to like say mount a meaningful challenge to the concept of private property around like the destruction of people's like livelihoods and the spaces that they've been living in due to forces that they are not in control of and you know like this is a i mean it's obviously like it's like a big abstract idea but i think we're going to really need to be able to kind of figure some of this stuff out um, otherwise we're going to miss really important opportunities, you know, and I think we have comrades that are doing work that look more like that in a lot of different parts of the world where there's already, uh, this is already coming to a head perhaps more than it has in, in some of our particular local contexts. And we're going to need to be able to learn from them. Um, you know, we're going to need to be able to think, think more creatively based on the like collective experience and, uh, you know, collective experimentation of the people that that are that are doing with stuff all over the world. Um, you know, be it be it in Greece, be it in Chile, be it wherever. You know, um, China. China. Things are gonna get. All right, things are gonna get just crazier and crazier. Yeah. yeah. Everyone I know who works in climate, and I have been talking, and uh, it's like, well, stuff is already wild but i don't see any lack of wildness in the near to immediate to probably somewhat far future um, <laughs> yeah so hold uh, on folks <laughs> i mean i like i joke about it but it's not really too much of a joke it's not too far off from like reality is that i do think that like i see some of this as like almost a survival project yeah absolutely um, and like we're building these relationships and doing this organizing work because if we don't like, you know, there are real consequences that could impact. What is it like, you know? Yeah, I mean, not to come back to the thing that I said I wasn't gonna get that far into, but you know, like I, again, I live in California, my parents are in Reading mm -hmm. and the white nationalists and Christian nationalists are doing this work. They are taking this seriously. They know what's going on. They're not stupid. You know, you've got the Bundys occupying the mouth of the Klamath River at the beginning of COVID because that's where the water that grows all the food for that we eat in the U.S. is coming from. And, you know, it's like this kind of stuff that's going on. Like, we need to take it seriously. Like, we, you know, put off the reality that we're facing down at our own risk and not just our risk but the risk to our communities because if we don't organize to do basic needs provisioning together you know if we can't take care of each other then what we have right now and you see the same thing with like the uh, the trucker convoys for example right is you have other people who are not politically aligned with us by any stretch of the imagination are quite hostile to the things that we're trying to get done telling people that they care about their material needs and trying to demonstrate to them that they can do something about that. But they're really, you know, they're gatekeeping who can and can't access that along lines that are like, you know, unconscionable to us. So we need to, we need to be really thoughtful about how, how we move forward with this, you know, this horizon to, to engage. After the, uh, after the Texas uh, power debacle uh, last winter, 
Was it last winter? Yep, yeah, it was last time winter. Does, time doesn't make any sense to me anymore. Mm, there was either. a, I think it was an American Prospect or some like conservative magazine, um, wrote like a wrote an article about how the left is doing mutual aid and we're not. And if we don't, if we don't do mutual aid, that's and there the 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 um the title of the piece was the best time to organize was yesterday, which. <laughs> I fucking take that Sounds shit apart. <laughs> yeah. So I think that um I think that it's one of those things where um and we've studied how the right has been able to do this and the circumstances they've been able to do this. I personally think that it's they've got a they have a particular set of self imposed hurdles in the US mm-hmm. that are real. But that doesn't mean that it's not that they are any less dangerous or any less, and that we should be talking about how the right is doing these things, because if we're not, then we're gonna miss. We're we're gonna we're gonna be blindsided when, you know, uh, a local like uh, here in Chicago, we had a the uh, the dreadhead cowboy was riding around on his horse, uh, you know, during the uprising, and then six months later he was showing up at Q rallies. For the kids, right? And so we've got to be uh, we've got to be assessing what the other side is doing in these regards because yeah. so in many ways they have a lot of advantages because they're not worried about who they're taking money from, mm-hmm. right? And they're not worried who they're uh, and they have people who have a lot of resources who are ready to try and gin up or provide support for what they want to do, their projects. I mean, they also have um, a lot of advantages, as we know, because they have a very different relationship to state power, you yeah. know? So, like, I brought up Redding, for example, because maybe people who are outside of California don't know this. I don't know. But, you know, rural California is, has a very, very well-organized and well-established militia culture. Like, and in Redding, where my parents live, they have a majority for the local government. Like they have a legal majority. They got voted in. They run the local government. The sheriff and the deputy sheriff are open white nationalists. Nobody like this is not, you know what I mean? This is not like a hypothetical thing. It's like they've been doing a really effective job of taking over like state institutions at the local level out here. You know, Orville seceded. It's a, a city right near Paradise, California that burned down where you had the three percenters coming in and posting up armed outside of relief centers and deciding who could come in and who couldn't. But you know, like the city of Oroville seceded during the pandemic because they didn't want to do mass mandates. Nobody did anything about it. You know, I mean, obviously they're probably still taking federal money. I don't know. I can't imagine they wouldn't be, but you know what I mean? It's like, these aren't like far off realities. This is, these are current realities. Although I do feel like we've gotten a little bit off topic. I don't know if we <laughs> want to come back to this. No, no, I, I, I yeah. we can we can tie it back together. But I think it's good for people to understand some of this. I, I often think um, that the concern about fighting fascist is often not wrong, but misplaced in who they think the serious threats are, because most of the threats are not immediately visible, and they are better funded than people realize. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, I would also, Connor, when people say the left doesn't have money, that's not true. We just wasted on stupid bullshit. So, <laughs> like, like, like rent. Well, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, like, like I, I, I won't, I won't throw too much shade. But there are particular leftist authors who've gotten paid like ten grand to write for Collaborationist magazine. Um. So, uh, some people aren't afraid of taking dark money. Um. And, and they're not using it to build projects or to organize. Um, and that's, you know, that to me is a even more problematic element of it. I, I, like if, if people were reinvesting sketchy money into their communities, I, I don't love it, but I don't know that I would say no to it either. Um, well, I mean, okay, what did the, we saw the, you know, communiques from the comrades in Ukraine, right? Like, whatever, let's not open this situation about what it is. But what did they say? They said for the, you know, the, the, the past that we know, we've been trying to keep these low wage jobs that keep us in, you know, in direct contact with people who are being exploited. We're getting tech jobs now because we have to buy guns. You know, I think the point is just that it's not like we're, I think we're past, like, you know, we, we, we need to think more. 
I don't know, like what, you know, what is the, what is the reality of the situation that we're facing and where are we making different kinds of tactical decisions to be effective in our long-term strategies and where are we hamstringing ourselves with different conceptions of purity that maybe like don't make sense in our context if we're being really honest about what we're dealing with here. And like, I'm not suggesting that we all need to go out and get tech jobs, right? But like, I am suggesting that maybe the range of, of like sensible and principled action right now is a little bit broader than some people think. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess this is a, I don't want to get too too bogged down down a dark path because that's normally what this show is and I'm trying not to do that all the time. Um, uh, because specifically, actually, I've had more and more people ask me, what am I to do? And I'm always, my, my, first, my first response to them is actually, how are you taking care of yourself? Because mm -hmm. if you are not taking care of yourself, you're useless. Actually, you're worse than useless. You're a liability. Um, but I don't tell them the second part because that's not going to help them take care of themselves. That's going to put them in an anxiety spiral. But it is a truth um, that people have to look at. And I think one of the things about these community gathering things, when people talk about, I mean, there's been debates about joy and not joy and discipline and organizing. And these debates have made my eyes roll at both sides, actually, because mm. usually it's like we either all need to be Puritans or everything needs to be a party all the time and neither of those things are remotely true um, um but uh I, I have thought about like why something like this dual uh dual power gathering is important because what you said earlier about if we if this costs us more energy than we need uh, than we have it is unsustainable and unfortunately the reason why the left has relied on students is because they have a lot of energy and you can burn them out and there's there's like new ones four years later i mean like that's like a, it's a sad truth but it's a truth yeah. like so that's not a sustainable cycle though as, as colleges change as covid's bomb the education system and this and the other um so i think it's important to focus on the community this community building element as something it's not just about like hippy dippy fun stuff. It's about our ability to have the energy resources and networks. Like, mm -hmm. leftists underestimate the power of networks. I, 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 which is weird actually when you think about how much we talk about solidarity and like what is that anyway. But it's 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 important to have networks. I think we don't like that word because it's used by sketchy you know neoliberal business people. Um, but every now and then I'm like, there's a reason why they use it. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's a useful thing to have. Um, so what kind of, you know, um, this makes me think though, I guess my last question is going to be with this need for networks, with this need for positive, for some positivity and an, and, a, and an admittedly increasingly dire and grim discourse, because I'm also not into giving people false hope. That's not what I do. I think there's plenty of leftists who do that as like their main bread and butter on unfortunately um but uh why now why is this coming about now in this particular time two years into the biden administration as the dsa has had a massive decline in membership etc and so forth why is this happening now i uh, i got really uh frustrated with where things were going and Last summer, I started talking to people about we we're going to do something different. Uh, honestly, that's where we kind of, that's why we kind of started. And I think that part of, there were questions about, there were people who were using the term dual power in really sketchy ways, like Maoists who work for, uh, you know, NGOs, uh, basically slapping a community meeting on their, uh, on whatever their existing NGO campaign was, being like, well, this is assembly. This is a you know a, a working class assembly that's going to co-sign off on this, you know, um, NGO priority that I've you know I'm getting paid to make happen. Um, I think that there one of my regrets when I was in DSA was that we didn't spend more time building these kind of things out. We talked a lot about like getting uh, focusing on getting people in the same space to build the relationships, to do the skill shares, um, to build trust. Um, 
we called it we jokingly called it the yurt vention uh one of the uh one of the uh current members of the dsa's mpc uh uh jen mckinney she uh she was out in eugene and this was before she ascended up to the uh, mpc and we were gonna try and get you know like a hundred you know uh, stray anarchists who'd wandered into DSA uh, all together to do these sorts of things. And the problem was that DSA kept sucking all of our attention away from doing this. And um, instead of building our, up our own infrastructure, we kept getting sucked into like a black hole for our, you know, our attention and energy. And, and we we're just watching people drop like flies um, from being like stuck in these really terrible interscene like they call it intercaucus warfare inside of like this big organization. And I think enough of us finally got out of it and we processed, it took us a year or two to process where we were going to be at. And after 2020, we were just like, fuck it. Let's, we need to start like doing something very different. And part of it means getting together. I don't know about you, Shannon. That's kind of my, my take on where, yeah. why now? I mean, I think there's a moment. I've been, you know, I've been interested in these kind of questions, uh, which I think is not in any way new in our organizing milieus. Like I'm, somebody mentioned in the at the Woodbine gathering, which I thought was like, you know, like that every ten years or so, someone thinks we need an above ground anarchist organization. Well, we kind of need it all the time, but like, all right, um, we try it again. And the, you know, the thing is, it's sort of we have we've learned a lot of lessons. I think in the past, like five five years, like 10 years, whatever, right? Like there are a lot of things that have sort of come up since like, I mean, even if we want to start like, you know, like lessons post occupy and then for and whatever, like, you know, like there's a, there's a lot that's been, that's been sort of crystallizing that was unclear before. I think we have a much clearer idea of what our climate change reality is going to be like, even though obviously the timeline is super unpredictable. Um, I think we have a much clearer idea of like sort of what kinds of relationships are going to make it possible for us to be flexible and resilient in these kinds of situations and not like rigid and not brittle. You know, I think we have learned a lot in terms of how the work of relationship building is a lot about the work of translation. I think we've learned a lot from a lot of the experiences that we've been we've been part of. And I think those of us that came to DSA as anarchists, like, you know, of course, like I've been out of DSA over four years, right? Um, those of us that came there, came there because we thought it was important that there was a place that people could come and find the politics and learn about the politics and like become acclimated to how to live in in a in a space that's that's run on these kind of like values structures and like experiment with what that might look like, you know? And I think we all saw that that was something that was valuable and that's why we put the time and effort into trying to build up space around the LSC. You know, I personally like wasn't really involved in national LSC organizing much, but like I thought it was important that it was happening and I still think that. And there are other organizations that are trying to come in to like help to build up these networks right now. And I think that there's a lot of value that can come out of those. Symbiosis is a great example. Um, but they are largely for existing organizations and they're largely for people who are already organized in and around spaces where they have a sense of what it is that their projects are about. And what we need, I think, is bridges between like different spaces that can make it possible for us to work together and make it possible for new people to come in and learn. And one of the, you know, the the really cool things I think that, it, you know, that we have to, to move forward here is we, we like some other conversations we're talking about, like, you know, some of us are moving into these kind of like movement elder spaces now, all of a sudden, you know, when we're in our, we're in our late thirties and we're in our forties and we're in our fifties and whatever. And we've seen these things and anarchists, uh, you know, kind of have, we all know we have like a, a pretty bad historical memory and like generation after generation, we make the same mistakes we made before. And like, they're a little bit different. And the, you know, we have new ideas of like, what's the sort of ground, like the ground moves, you know, like what we take for granted moves. But I think we have a hard time recognizing the gains we make and we have a hard time like really like engaging with the the ways that we are challenged to grow and this kind of stuff you know but um 
that there, I think there's a, there's a hunger for the kind of things that we, that we have to offer now based on our politics and based on the structures that we like to, to sort of like come together in. And, you know, you said something about false hope. Um, I, I also am, I'm careful about false hope. Like, I think we need to be really realistic about what the world is that we're trying to get involved in. But at the end of the day, like our strategies and our tactics, they don't, create false hope they create real meaning they create yeah. they they have they provide an actual like really tangible valuable thing for people right like we know i mean you know again you know i'm going to come back to my own research right like some of the um primary protective factors against the development of long-term traumatic stress disorders like the biggest ones are meaningful social support a sense of agency and a sense of meaning Right. And those are things that participation in these kind of projects in the face of the reality that we're looking at can offer people. Right. And we see that like we see that in, you know, in the examples of things that people are doing in other parts of the world. We see that in our own lives, in our own relationships. You know what I mean? Like people need this. And absent that, they're going to look for other answers. And those are answers are things that, that terrify me. So like <laughs> I really feel like we need to be there making this open, making it welcoming making it exciting making it feel good and i know like whatever you know like not everything here is going to feel good but like we need to provide these positive visions of the politics we need to provide a positive vision of the future we need to provide a like a a, a way to imagine a way through this that doesn't look like nihilist nihilism and you know like whatever i'm not going to get on anybody's ass about that like if that's how you're feeling that's how you're feeling but i don't want you to feel that way because i need your fucking help sorry for my language it was like this gets really you know it gets like it, it's what you could look at me really funny that's cute okay but you know i'm just trying to I'm, i want to be i want to be realistic here it's like like i need all the help i can get i know that and i know that everybody else i know feels that way too and if we're not really thinking about this you know, from a perspective of how we can create something that makes it seem possible for us to keep moving, like, then we're all going to stop. And that's not a world that I feel really hopeful about being part um, of. <laughs> one, of the, one of the discussions that we've been having a lot of lately is, like, do we all have to have a shared vision for how this is going to unfold so that we can move forward together? Because we very much have a tension inside of, like, our groups where pe there are people who have, I think, pretty dark visions of where like things are going. And, you know, and there are people who it's a little bit less dark or whatever, but because they don't, they're not all on, on board with the exact same vision of how this is going to happen as long to me, I don't give a fuck. Like, I don't give a fuck if you are, if you are a, you know, a black pilled, uh, nihilist who, you know, like has like wheat pasted like uh, the pages of desert inside of your like uh, bedroom and like, you know, and has all the windows covered with tinfoil. As long as you're showing up and doing shit, like, right? Like, that's the most important thing is mm -hmm. that we are, you know, and I was also, I was kind of joking. It's like, you know, if you're, because there's, there's discourse around like, is this too dark? Is this like demobilizing people, whatever? And I'm like, if you're being demobilized by a thing that you've read, maybe you just need to be demobilized and set on the side and process where, what all this knowledge means and then come to us when you're ready. Because at a certain point, like, you know, um, as a nurse, I hate to say that, but you know, as a nurse, I got, uh, you know, they teach us about, you know, the stages of mourning, mm -hmm. right? And we can be in mourning for like a promised future that like probably isn't going to happen, or we can be mourning for um, our like an innocence of like what you know the world holds for us, or what you know for a nonviolent political solution to all these problems, right? And moving through those stages of mourning, everyone's going to be at a different point. But that doesn't mean as long as we're showing up and doing the work and supporting each other and like able to do what needs to happen so that these sorts of collective political projects actually do like unfold and the relationships are built and that people are taking care of each other and that we're like fighting because it's not just about collective care. It's also about collective care so that we can show up to the fight. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that, you know, as long as people are able to do that, I don't really care. 
I, it's not that I don't care about that person's particular position or where they're at, but I'm not going to fight that person because they don't share the exact same like understanding. You, you know? don't care about being right. Like no. it's not important anymore who's right because <laughs> none of us are right. You know, like they're just, just that's it's ridiculous, right? Um, and it should be clear, like when I'm talking about like a positive vision, like of the future or whatever, I don't mean like everything's going to be great and it's all going to be roses. I mean that there's something that we can do, right? That we have like control to whatever extent over what we do with our lives, what we do with our time, and we can make meaning around that. That actually does create something really like profound that has its own sort of like momentum, you know? That like, yeah. I mean, there's 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 so there's like so little. I think. Um, clarity that people really have anymore and like i think just to whatever extent like we need to like kind of move away from the idea that we need these sort of like clear understandings of what like what the future is going to look like right like we just need to be able to like as john was saying like work together to move in a direction that like looks more like the world we'd want to see and then we'll do the best we can from there and, like we're gonna have lots of opportunities to come up with ideas that right now like are beyond our imagining as we move move forward in the world together and that's just going to be you know it's going to be how it is come so, come well, join come join me in a political project that builds a future that my two children can survive in <laughs> who gives a shit just we we've got to we've got to have a world where um our you know the future isn't constrained is not like we have the ability to live a freer life that is also survivable. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> not just <laughs> not just survivable, but like that we would actually want to live in. You know? Yes. I'm not particularly interested in Mad Max Hell World. I mean, no. you can survive in that, but um, yeah, I think that's that's an important point because while I am often accused of being black pilled um, and that's uh, i don't i actually don't think that's true but i do think a lot of the news i give people is often hard for them to process um uh i i i think it's important that you have a positive vision and you take this community thing seriously and, and i specifically say these community things i know that community is this nebulous thing that liberals abuse and thus it's become kind of a weird word on the but it's vital because um, if you don't have it, uh, you're not going to be able to, you, you won't find the stuff to sustain you. And, uh, and as much as I, fuck, there's a capital reading group in my discord. But uh, as, much, as, as much as I don't have a problem with that, I don't think even someone as cerebral as me actually survives off that. In fact, I know I don't. Uh -uh. Like... Um, it's very important that you participate in your local community, that you know who your neighbors are, that you know who your allies are, that you know what the unions are. I mean, and look, I'm like, I'm in a union. I'm an AR for union. I, I'm, I'm not here to lie to you about how awesome that is. It's absolutely kind of a shit show a lot of the time, but um, well, that's, that's human shit, right? <laughs> like, but it's important that you do it too. Mm -hmm. Like, um, if you're going to critique business unions and guild unions and all that, you should probably know what they actually are now, as opposed to like, I don't know, reading about shit in the 19th century before Eugene Debs, which, you know, I got no problem with Debs, but that's not my point. Um, you, you do need to know where the situation is right now. And I often find that if you're not engaging in stuff like this, you don't know. And uh, unfortunately for like a lot of the DSA people and a lot, of, and even more true for the media people. So I'm talking to my peers here. Um, they are not involved in those kinds of things, either because they don't have access to it or they <coughs> they don't really want to be. Uh, or or uh, in some cases, um, the left, uh, left media and left organizations often don't operate um, off of the principles that they encourage others to do. So... Um, hey, it's a lot easier to have a conversation with the uh, with the guy that works in the Sparks factory that I've created in my head than it is to actually like you know show up and talk with like union nurses or union teachers or union janitors yeah. um, and find out what their lives are really like. 
you know, my coworkers who uh, are in a different union, but they're like the healthcare workers, you know, their life's their life is not, you know, uh, is not what I think many of these media people think it is. Um, and they give a fuck about like police in their communities or getting evicted, that sort of stuff. These are real fucking like things that they've got to deal with. Mm-hmm. And if their union isn't functioning because it's been captured by like someone who, uh, you know, uses it like as like a, you know, a form of political graft or whatever, like that's really terrible um, for them. And like, we need to like help, you know, we need to fix that. But too many people seem to like have like the, it's boosterism of things without um, understanding what the reality is. And I think that that really turns a lot of working folks off because like, they're going to look at you like you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Because you don't. Because yeah. you don't. <laughs> I mean, I think like we can see that, you know, whatever our like political positions or our projects may be, like the world that we want is one that's based on material and non material interdependence. Because that is the alternative to this kind of like, you know, horror shit show, Mad Max future that you're talking about. And if we're not practicing that and we're not building those relationships in our own lives, that's what community is, right? Like community is a space of interdependence and within that interdependence, you have accountability where you can like, you know, sort of impact like how sort of community norms are developed and like how we're going to treat each other. And really like, it's a big question. Like how do we want to be together? Right. But like interdependence is the human survival skill. That is like what has allowed us to just like, you know, become fucking, and, and you know, uh, like invasive all over the world. Right? <laughs> like that's why we've been so successful. Like, you know, like yeah, we, we have- kind of suck at any individual element of being an animal. Yeah, like we're weak for <laughs> we're weak for great apes. We we don't have claws. Our teeth kind of suck. Our heads are too big. We have a good brain, but we waste it on a lot of weird shit. Um, we can't climb uh, very well. We burn in the sun. You know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like we don't have enough hair on our bodies to like protect. I mean, it, it's it's you're you're absolutely right. It's a crucial thing to realize. And I'd like to thank you both for coming on. Um, um, wait if- a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Real quick. First off, just we have to say this because we uh, we have a fundraiser. It's uh, on uh, Open Collective, um, and we have maxed out our capacity for uh, getting people into campsites unless we have people donate to uh, help support the event. So we're still shy, shy of our fundraising goal by about $2,500, and until we surpass that, like it gets, uh, we do have run into issues in terms of being able to uh, support all the people that we want to have come. So uh, check out... Um, Varn, I'll show, I'll give you all of our links, but uh, check out our fundraising page. We've got open collected, so it's all very transparent where the money's going, what it's being spent on. Which is important. Um, Thank you. I say also, if you don't have money to give, but you think you've got something that you can contribute that's going to save money to the event, like that is as good as money and better. Right? Fuck! Like, if you have a bus, if you have a bus, yeah, bring your bus. <laughs> you will. You will be. Uh, you will be feted. As a uh, as a movement uh, as a movement uh, uh, rock star, as much as this crew of people will let you be, <laughs> right? Yeah, like to put to all this conversation we've been having about decommodification through relationship, right? We either need more money, or we need people who have more of the things we need. And this is food, and this is transportation capacity. These are really like the big limiting logistical factors for us right now. Um, but we're doing a, a poll of the people who have signed up to come to the event right now to try to make sure we can make as much space as possible because we want as many people who want to be there uh, to be there. You know, Some as, people as who thought they could come can't come. There is space. We're, we're working on it. Yeah. There's still work to happen. But like the, the sort of things that become bottlenecks is like right now, uh, even my kid's school is having trouble sourcing a, a, a company that will uh, take kids in a school bus. No, um, school buses are are very difficult to come across right now. <laughs> so, um, ju- just like those are the sorts of things. Yeah, and- hit us hit us up, help out. If you also, if you're planning to come and you want to help with organizing, we definitely need your help. So, yeah, um, yeah, like we're gonna, it's gonna be on site. It's gonna be before, you know whatever. Like we, yeah, we can, you know, as we were talking about, like we don't based on the capacity we have now, we're at capacity. So help us grow our capacity so that we can have more people come. It is going to be great though. I'm, I have 
great feelings about how this is moving. We are building, like the good thing is, is that it's not a tiny group of people making this happen. It is actually an expanding group of people making this happen, which bodes well for it being successful. All right. I got to go too. So I'm going to let you wrap this up. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you guys for coming on. I will have all the links in the show notes uh, for the fundraiser and to register if you have your own car or a place to stay in Chicago. Um, or if, like me, you uh, register and will probably show up and sleep in your car. Um, so, because, um, uh, you know, I've done that many times. Um, so, check that out. Thank you guys for coming up. I think this is, I actually do think this is important. I've been talking to John on the back end about this for a long time. Um, and so I'm glad that you guys come on and it, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Yeah. Great to talk to you. All Thanks right, we'll Derek. See. Have a good night. All see right. you in Indiana. <laughs> Thanks Shannon. <laughs>